This morning we'll be reading from Ephesians 1 and verse 15. This is Ephesians chapter 1, verse 15. For this reason, ever since I heard about your faith in the Lord Jesus and your love for all the saints, I have not stopped giving thanks for you, remembering you in my prayers. I keep asking that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the glorious Father, may give you the spirit of wisdom and revelation so that you may know him better. I pray also that the eyes of your heart may be enlightened in order that you may know the hope to which he has called you, the riches of his glorious inheritance in the saints and his incomparably great power for us who believe. That power is like the working of his mighty strength, which he exerted in Christ when he raised him from the dead and seated him at the right hand in the heavenly realms far above all rule and authority, power and dominion, and every title that can be given, not only in the present age, but also in the one to come. And God placed all things under his feet and appointed him to be head over everything for the church, which is his body, the fullness of him who fills everything in every way. This is the reading of God's word. Good morning, everyone. Lovely to see you on a cold day, but the heat is working, and it's certainly not as cold as it was when I first arrived here this morning, so I trust that uh, you're all warm and comfortable and will stay with me. Do please keep the passage open, which Ruby read for us, and I will pray. Heavenly Father, we do want to thank you and praise you for the awesome privilege of an open Bible, Uh, We are mindful of those many believers around the world for whom that privilege um, is just not there. So we pray this morning that your word would be our rule and guide, your Holy Spirit, our teacher, and your glory, our supreme concern. And we ask it for Christ our Saviour's sake. Amen. Good. Well, towards the end of the 19th century, uh, five young college students were spending a Sunday in London, and they decided to go and listen to the famous Baptist preacher, C.H. Spurgeon. And uh, while they were waiting for the doors of the church to open, uh, the students were greeted by uh, a man at the door uh, who said, it's lovely to have you here. Um, Can I give you a guided tour? Uh, Let me start by showing you our heating plant. Well, it was the middle of July, and it was a boiling hot day, so they weren't really that interested in seeing the heating plant. But uh, they didn't want to offend this nice man, so they agreed to go with him. And uh, the stranger led them down a stairway, and when they reached the bottom of the stairs, he quietly opened a door, and uh, he whispered to the students, this is our eating plant. And the students were absolutely astonished to see 700 people bowed in prayer, all praying for the Lord's blessing on the service that was about to begin upstairs. Softly closing the door, the A guy who'd given them the guided tour introduced himself, and it was none other than Spurgeon himself. But that's quite something, isn't it? 700 people praying for God's blessing before the church service even begins. I was going to say if anything like that is happening in Cape Town this morning, I certainly don't know about it. But then I was rather challenged because this afternoon I'm going to preach out at Cryfontaine Baptist Church and they do have a one-hour prayer meeting before the service starting at five o'clock and would I like to be there? So I've been rebuked. But it's certainly not a very common thing. And no doubt there are lots of reasons for that. 
But one of them, I think, must be that most Christians today don't really believe that prayer changes things. Their attitude, I think, is that prayer is a great spiritual discipline when we have the time. But if we want our services to be meaningful, if we want the church to be producing mature disciples, if we want to be an effective witness in today's anti-God culture, well, essentially it's down to us. Now, many Christians think like that. But can I say that that attitude is perilously close to unbelief? And more often than not, what I think lies behind our prayerlessness is a suspicion that God is actually not powerful enough to do the things that he's promised. And uh, because we're nice people, we don't actually want to embarrass him by asking. Now, there's nothing new in that. Uh, On the last two Sunday mornings, we've seen, haven't we, that Paul is writing to a young church facing massive hostility and opposition from the culture. And Paul's purpose is to deepen their faith so that these believers will grow and mature. And you'll remember that he began by revealing God's plan for the whole universe and God's intention to give every believer a special place in it. But knowing their situation, Paul anticipates that somebody is going to be thinking, well, look, this sounds absolutely marvellous. But is God really powerful enough to pull it off? Can he actually do it? Uh, And in our passage this morning, the way that Paul addresses that line of thinking is by giving them a prayer report. He tells this church how he's praying for them. And his prayer report is designed to deepen their understanding of the power that God has given to Jesus and to show them how as believers they can tap into it. So what can we learn? How do we pray God's power into this church, St Barnabas? How do we do that? Well, according to this passage, we've got to embrace three priorities. And the first, a rather strange one, is to thank God for real Christians. Thank God for real Christians. Come with me to verse 15. Can we all see verse 15 in our Bibles? Paul says, verse 15, For this reason, ever since I heard about your faith in the Lord Jesus and your love for all the saints, I have not stopped giving thanks for you remembering you in my prayers. Now, I was actually surprised and rather convicted to see that the first thing that Paul mentions in his prayer report is something so simple. I mean, it's so very ABC, isn't it? I think we might have expected him to start by mentioning something far more impressive, Uh, perhaps thanking God for a superb evangelistic outreach in the amphitheatre at Ephesus, or uh, for the fact that they'd grown so fast they needed a bigger building immediately, or thanking God for news that uh, several members are training to go into the mission field. Those are the sort of things we might have expected him to start with in his prayer. Now those things might have been happening, but the first thing Paul does is to say that he's been thanking God that there are people in this church who have faith in the Lord Jesus and love for all the saints. The kind of thing we might take for granted, Paul does not. And that's because, you see, these two things mark out the real Christian from the casual churchgoer. Now, no doubt there were some of both in the Ephesian church, just as there are in every church. But you see, Paul doesn't want the presence of real Christians in the fellowship to be taken for granted. And the real Christian can always be recognized 
by the same two things mentioned in verse 15. The real Christian has faith in Jesus as Lord. So first thing in the morning when he leaps out of bed, he says, yes, Jesus, I know you're Lord, and once again I'm giving myself up to you. And if that confession is genuine, it will always, without exception, be mirrored in the love that he has towards his brothers and sisters in Christ. And that's a principle, you see, that we find again and again and again throughout the New Testament. That our faith, which is invisible, is proved by the visible love we have towards our brothers and sisters. You see, I can say I believe. It's such an easy thing to say, isn't it? <clears throat> but how can you tell whether it's true or not? And Paul says, look at how he is with other Christians at church. Now that, I think, gives us an extremely valuable diagnostic tool for recognizing when a church is heading for trouble. Once the people in church start to cool off in their love for the saints, you can be absolutely certain they're cooling off in their faith in the Lord Jesus. Because those two things always go together. You cannot separate them. Now, that wasn't the case in Ephesus. The gospel really had changed these people. And what Paul is saying to them here is, I am absolutely thrilled by what God has done in your lives, and I just can't stop thanking him enough for it. Now, I think it is perhaps just worth pausing on this for a moment, because as we read this, it's quite tempting, isn't it, to think that the Ephesian church was already a perfect congregation. A perfect faith in Jesus, perfect love for the saints, a perfect church. But of course, that can't be true. Uh, we saw, didn't we, last week that the Ephesian church uh, consisted of two groups of people who had absolutely nothing in common before they heard the gospel. In fact, they disliked each other intensely. The differences between them were immense. Quite obviously, those differences didn't simply melt away overnight. And just to make the point, won't you turn over to chapter 4? Just turn over in your Bible to chapter 4, verse 1. And I want you to think about this. Paul writes, chapter 4, verse 1, As a prisoner for the Lord, then, I urge you to live a life worthy of the calling you have received. Be completely humble and gentle. Be patient, bearing with one another in love. Make every effort to keep the unity of the Spirit through the bond of peace. Now think about this. Paul wouldn't need to say any of those things if they were already loving each other perfectly. You know, he wouldn't need to tell them to bear with one another if there were, weren't some people in the church who were, quite frankly, pretty unbearable. And he wouldn't need to emphasize the unity of the Spirit if they were already perfectly united. I mean, it would be a waste of expensive parchment, wouldn't it? No, they were not a perfect church. There was still plenty of work to be done. But you see, there was sufficient evidence of real heart transformation for Paul to be thankful for their conversion and also to tell them. Now, I think that's really important. I mean, just imagine how these people would feel when Paul's letter arrived in Ephesus and was read out in church on Sunday morning. Uh, what would they have been saying to each other over coffee after the service? Well, one man would be saying to his friend, you know, that was just so encouraging. Uh, the truth is, um, I've been really struggling lately, uh, struggling to read my Bible, struggling to love my wife, but what Paul has said has really woken me up. Won't you please pray for me? And uh, his friend says, well, yes, of course I will. But I also want you to know that my wife and I have heard that you're reading your Bible every night with your children and that you're actively involved in the homeless ministry. 
And I want you to know that we are thanking God for your example. Now you see, what an important lesson Paul is giving us here. You see, Paul's word of encouragement is encouraging them how to encourage each other. It's teaching them, isn't it? So do we actually thank God for the evidence of his grace that we see in one another's lives? Do we ever tell each other? I mean, do you see the difference it would make if we did more of that? Can I suggest that if we want to see God's power at work in St. Barnabas, this would be an absolutely terrific place to start. Let's thank God that he has actually graced us in this fellowship with people who have faith in the Lord Jesus and love for all the saints. And even though none of us is perfect, especially me, uh, let's encourage each other for the evidence of God's grace that we can see in one another's lives. So that's the first thing. Thank God for real Christians. Second, uh, if we're going to pray God's power into this church, we must ask God for spiritual eyesight. Ask God for spiritual eyesight. Paul's main prayer request is actually there in verse 17. In verse 17 he says, um, I keep asking that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the glorious Father, may give you the spirit of wisdom and revelation so that you may know him better. Now it's really important to see what Paul is not praying for there. Uh, this is not a prayer for more knowledge about God. You know, God doesn't save people so that they can write a three-hour exam about him. No, he saved us so that we might know God in our lives, so that we might have a personal relationship with him. So what Paul is actually praying for there in verse 17 is that the Spirit of God would open up the word of God's revelation in Scripture to show us more clearly who God is and how we can relate to him as his dearly loved children. Because that's how we get to know God better. One of the best uh, explanations of what this means in practice is in a book by a guy called J.I. Packer, who is now with the Lord, but it's a famous book called Knowing God, and it's entirely devoted to this subject. And I'd like to read you something from it. I hope it's going to appear on the screen. This is what he says about this business of knowing God. First, knowing God is a matter of personal dealing. It's a matter of dealing with him as he opens up to you and being dealt with by him as he takes knowledge of you. Second, knowing God is a matter of personal involvement in mind, will, and feeling. The believer rejoices when his God is vindicated and feels the acutest distress when he sees God flouted or despised. Equally, the Christian feels shame and grief when convicted of having failed his Lord. And third, knowing God is a matter of grace. It is a relationship in which the initiative throughout is with God, as it must be, since God is so completely above us and we have so completely forfeited all claim on his favour by our sins. Now that last point, that third point, is really important. Knowing God, my friends, is a matter of grace. If I am to know God better, the initiative lies with him. And that's why Paul prays in verse 18 that the eyes of your heart may be enlightened. 
Uh, I'm told that when you reach the age of 60, um, you need three times as much light to read by as when you were 20. Uh, some of us need a great deal more than that. That is the idea that Paul is driving at here. If any of us are going to get to know God better, we need more spiritual light. But unless God gives it to us, well, we won't really see, we won't fully appreciate all the wonderful spiritual blessings that God has given us that we've been thinking about together over the last couple of weeks. Is that serious? Definitely. Our problem is that we believe that what we see with our human eyes is all that there is, that there isn't anything else. That's what most people believe. If I can't see it, it doesn't exist. I hope you know that's not true. But unless God actually opens our eyes to see the full reality and to be spiritually alive to it, the danger is that the hostile world all around us will seem to us to be the only reality that there is. And in the end, that hostile world will just overwhelm us completely. So can I say that what Paul is uh, asking for here is not a nice to have. It's, it's not a bonus blessing for elite Christians only. This is essential for every believer. Let me give you an illustration from nature. Until not so long ago, scientists believed that blue whales were mute, uh, that they didn't sing. But now, apparently, using the, the latest technology, they've discovered that the voices of blue whales resonate very powerfully, but at a frequency that is too low for the human ear to pick up. So we can't hear it. But using these marvellous special instruments, they've now discovered that the, the call of the blue whale is so powerful that it can actually carry over hundreds, and in some cases, even thousands of miles. I'm told that a, a blue whale uh, can call from somewhere in the ocean off Cape Town and be heard by another blue whale off the coast of Rio de Janeiro. It's pretty amazing, isn't it? What's the point? The point is that blue whales have always had that amazing ability. But we were completely unaware of it because our human senses were unable to register it. Now, in the same way, what Paul is doing here is praying that the eyes of our heart will be enlightened by the Spirit that we will know, that we will register two spiritual realities that we would never have appreciated before. First, that we will know God's promise for the future, verse 18. He says, I pray that the eyes of your heart may be enlightened in order that you may know the hope to which he has called you the riches of his glorious inheritance in the saints. So can you see there that the call of Christ in the gospel is a call to look forward with confidence to the many wonderful things that God has promised to us in the future, that one day we really will be perfectly holy and blameless with the Lord Jesus, living with him in the new creation. And the first sign that my eyes have actually been opened is that that marvellous hope becomes more and more real and more and more important to me. And to help us, Paul says that one of the reasons we can trust God's promise for the future is because of the exceptionally high value that God places on the church. Stay with me here. This is really important. You see... Um, Paul says, notice this in the text in verse 18, he says that we are God's glorious inheritance. Now that means that we are infinitely precious to God. What even St. Barnabas, really? 
Yes, really. God looks at this fellowship this morning and he says, you are my glorious inheritance. You are my treasure chest. Now, if that is true, well, surely we can have complete confidence that God will keep his promise for the future. And that ought to shape the way that we think about our lives this morning. Matthew Henry was one of the greatest Puritan Bible scholars. His father's name was Philip. And uh, as a young man, Philip uh, fell in love with a young lady who came from a much higher social class than himself. Now, although this young lady had become a Christian a long time before and things like differences in class didn't matter to her one jot, uh, her parents saw this as a huge problem. And uh, they said to her, now this man, Philip Henry, uh, where does he come from? Uh, to which the future Mrs. Henry gave the immortal reply, well, I don't actually know where he's come from, but I do know where he's going. Now that, you see, is how we need to think of ourselves. If you are a Christian this morning, your worth is not determined by your background, by your track record, or by your present circumstances. It's not. Your worth is entirely determined by where you're going. You're going to the new creation where you will be like the Lord Jesus in every way. And that, you see, is what Paul means when he says that we are, you are, God's glorious inheritance. What an amazing thought. But secondly, Paul also prays that we will know God's power in the present. Now look down at verse 19. Verse 19 he says, I pray that you may know his incomparably great power for us who believe. Now, power is one of the big themes in Ephesians. And that's because, you see, this tiny church in Ephesus was surrounded by visible and extremely powerful anti-God forces. And Paul wants them to know that however powerful those forces might be, the power of God is infinitely greater. And notice this, according to verse 19, his power is for us who believe. Now this is so important for us to know as well, isn't it? Um, all of us know that there are plenty of things that make it really, really hard for us to keep going as Christians. Yes? Uh, I mean, there's the endless media barrage against Christianity. Uh, there's the social pressure from unbelieving friends and family. And perhaps most difficult of all, there's our own struggle with sin and our battle against the lies of the enemy. Now, friends, those are extremely powerful forces. Uh, and the problem, you see, is that the culture encourages you and me to try and deal with these things in our own strength, uh, sort of leaving God's power supply completely out of the equation. So there's the person who's been the Christian, a Christian for, for years, uh, who finds themselves trapped in an entrenched pattern of sin, and he says, you know, I've really, really tried, I have tried, but I just can't change. Or there's the abused spouse who says, I know I'm supposed to forgive. I know I am. But it's just so hard. And there's the new convert you know, who says, how can I even call myself a Christian if I carry on sinning like this? And I want to say to you this morning that God's power is not like ESCOM. There's no load shedding. No, the wonderful, wonderful good news of this passage is that God has a vast power supply that is always available to us who believe. Which is what Paul is saying at the end of verse 19. Now, Paul is teaching us that the way that we plug in 
the way that we connect to that power supply is by intercessory prayer. That is by praying for each other in the way that Paul has modelled for us here. So can I ask you, how are you doing with that? Um, Are you praying for the other people in your home group? Are you praying for the person behind you or in front of you in church this morning? Uh, Do you know what their prayer needs are so that you can actually pray for them intelligently? Because I want to say to you that there is no power without prayer. Let's get that clear. There's no power without prayer. Of course, Paul knows that all of us go through seasons where, when we doubt whether the power of God can make a meaningful difference in our lives. And that's why Paul says in verse 20, remember the resurrection. Remember the resurrection of Christ. Why? Why? I mean, what does the resurrection signify? Well, it signifies sin smashed. It signifies death defeated. And Jesus rising from the grave in in the power of an endless life. And what those things are doing is demonstrating the awesome power supply that is available to everyone who believes. So just think of it. The same power by which God raised Jesus from the grave is there to enable you and I to walk in a manner worthy of the calling we've received. It's there. It's right there. And the only thing that's going to cut us off from that power is our refusal to believe it, our reluctance to pray for it, and our failure to even want to live by it. So this week, let's pray for spiritual eyesight. Third, if we want to see God's power at work in the church, we must live in the light of ultimate reality. Now, I'm not very happy with my heading for this third point. It's a bit jargonistic, and I apologize for that. Let me explain what I mean. I do think this is actually one of the greatest challenges facing the church in the world today. I mean, how do we get to the point where we are sufficiently conscious of the immense spiritual power that is available to us so that we can be useful for God this week. That's the question, isn't it, arising from this passage. Let me give you an illustration from Kingdom Kids, and I hope Andrew will bear with me here. I want to talk about autism for a moment. I understand that one therapy that's used in the treatment of autism in children is to cloud the bottom half of their glasses so that they can't... uh, The problem with an autistic child face is that they can become so incredibly obsessed with a task or something that's immediately in front of them, they shut out the rest of the world. Is that right? Yes, someone's nodding, so I must be on the right track. As far as he's concerned, what he's doing is all that there is. There isn't anything else. That's his reality. And by clouding the bottom of the glasses, the child is forced to look up, to take his eyes off his little world just in front of him and consider the greater reality that is out there. Now, in exactly the same way, in this last section of chapter 1, Paul is, as it were, lifting our eyes from the problems all around us in the world and he's focusing us on something infinitely more wonderful. Come with me to verse 22. Verse 22. And God placed all things under Jesus' feet and appointed him to be head over everything for the church, which is his body, the fullness of him who fills everything in every way. Now that, my friends, is a picture of the supreme authority of Jesus Christ over everything you and I struggle against. All things 
have been placed under his feet by God. He's got power over the whole lot. Why has God done that? Well, verse 22 tells us quite clearly he's done it for the church. In other words, the power that God has given to Jesus is church power. And everything Jesus is doing with his power in the world today is for the church. So what? Well, one writer puts it like this. He says, quote, Christ, who is head over all things, is filling creation with his purposes for the church. As much as our perceptions today may seem to deny this truth, the battles that rage, the leaders that rise, the events that occur, do not frustrate his agenda. History marches forward toward the triumph of the church of Jesus Christ. That is the message of verse 22. It's very strengthening, I think. Because whatever the world might say about the church, the triumph of the church is the ultimate reality. Christ is head over everything for the church. Let me suggest three applications for our lives this week. Are you ready? Number one, there should be no despair. You see, despite all of the weaknesses in every local church, there is no more powerful organization for spreading hope in a hopeless world than a body of believers loving one another, helping and forgiving one another, and making disciples and reaching out to the lost. And the cumulative effect of many churches living like that is the world's greatest power for good. So there should be no despair. Second, there should be no deserters. You see, to attempt to live as a solitary Christian is actually to move beyond our spiritual supply lines, to use a military metaphor. Worse, it's actually to declare the body of Christ to be irrelevant to us, or even against our interests. Now, it's easy to do, because, of course, the church can sometimes be intolerant, blind, and quite frankly, a bit of a pain to put up with. But the church is also the beloved bride of Christ. And it is the only institution through which he will accomplish his purposes on earth. And that means that she is worth our effort and our faithful commitment. So no deserters. Third, there should be no surrender. See, those Christians who have their eyes open to God's purpose for the church are a power that nothing in this world can overcome. Now, of course, there are going to be setbacks and disappointments along the way. And there will be long periods where the church, and no doubt many of your friends and family, will consider the church to be totally irrelevant. The truth, however, is the exact opposite. Because all the resources of heaven are being poured out right now this morning for the church. And in the end... The church will prevail, and everyone will know it. So let's pray for that now. And God placed all things under the feet of Jesus and appointed him to be head over everything for the church. Heavenly Father, thank you for showing us that we matter to you, that the church is your glorious inheritance, your treasure chest. 
Unless you had told us, we would never have known it. Please help us to believe it, to treasure what you treasure, and to pray faithfully and intelligently for one another. For we long to experience more of your incomparably great power at work here in our fellowship. And so we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.